This is the Mobile Tech Podcast, brought to you by worldpodcasts.com. Now here's your host, Tank Girl, Miriam Joie. Brought to you by Infineon. Hi and welcome to the Mobile Tech Podcast. I'm your host, Miriam Joie, and today is Wednesday, January 19th, 2022. And I have a very special guest here today. I have Judy Davies of Infineon. Hi, Judy. How are you? Hi, Miriam. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing great. (laughs) Thanks for joining. So we're going to chat with Judy for a little bit about 5G, but not what you guys are thinking, and about Infineon a little bit. And then Jaime Rivera is going to join me to cover the news and the reviews for the week, like we always do. So, Judy... Infineon, I don't think my audience is necessarily familiar with what the company does. You're a chip company, right? We are. We're, we are a chip manufacturer. Um, we are one of the top 10 in the world. Um, it's an absolutely fantastic company. I mean, I've been here for, um, more than a year and a half, and I can say that it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, for those listeners who don't know a lot about Infineon, um, we are um, leading in a number of markets, uh, automotive, power discretes, microcontrollers, security IC, mems, memory. So um, some, some people may have heard of the company um, in the automotive space, but we play across an entire uh, broad market portfolio. Indeed. Yeah, I I cover cars for Tech Radar and you know, we've met a few times through some of the various events because of that and of course I'm attuned to Infineon on the kind of the car side. You guys make chips for inverters and motor controllers and stuff like that. Uh, a lot of it has to do with power and uh getting, you know, delivering power to the motors, the batteries, etc. And so um I'm also aware of exist, you know, of Infineon in terms of everything mobile and and computing side, right? But I think maybe you can elaborate a little bit about what what Infineon's role is there. You know, what does Infineon have to do with my phone, if anything? Yeah, so um, we have uh, devices, chips, ICs that um, go into a number of different types of applications that play into smart wearables, smartphones, um, automobiles. So these devices um, are are comprise of the, the power and sensors, as well as um, applications that serve the IoT space, um, 5G in terms of your smartphone, you know, the connectivity, the reliability of it, the memory. Um, so we, we really are in a lot of different aspects of every device that you have out there that's mobile. Yeah. So I think this is the takeaway, I feel like, is that, you know, Infineon is part of the fabric of what brings our phones to life. It doesn't have to be your device in your hand necessarily, but, you know, the kind of the entire food chain of the internet coming to your device, you know, uh, the the cell phone towers and all that, they have to deal with all kinds of power related things um, that, you know, high power amplifiers for the RF stuff. And we've got like, you know, regulating the power going into the antennas, like all kinds of crazy stuff. And Infineon is part of all of that in some way or another. So, you know, that's why they're my sponsors this week, because, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't be here without Infineon. So I want to talk to you about something that I think my audience can be excited about, and that's 5G, but not 5G, the public networks, well, public, they're owned by private companies, but not the 5G our phones necessarily connect to. The 5G that we've kind of been promised that kind of invisible 5G, you know the one, the private 5G. So say you're an Amazon warehouse and you have a whole bunch of warehouse robots and maybe, uh, you know, some of those automated carts that uh, follow tracks on the on the, on the the warehouse and, and maybe you have some drones that do inventory because I've seen that too. These devices need to be able to communicate with one another and to, traditionally, you know, th- they're devices that are not tethered they've had to be attached to some kind of Wi-Fi connection or some sort of radio connectivity. And one of the alternatives to that is to use 5G, right? 
um, but a private 5G net right side inside that warehouse. And then the, uh, the other thing is factories, right? Factories are very modular these days. And, you know, we, we talk about cars a lot, you and I, because we see each other in generally car-related things. And, you know, Volkswagen or whoever, when they want to change their factory from building one model to another, they don't, like, sometimes they build a brand new factory, but they don't generally do that. They just rearrange the factory floor w with new robots, new lines, and, and it's very expensive and complicated to do that when you have to change all the power connections and all the data connections because these robots are connected by some sort of Ethernet. Um, you know, so a lot of factories are moving to a wireless connectivity model. And I believe 5G private networks are being used for that because of low latency. And, and so let's talk about all that. I want you to kind of walk us through this entire universe that we don't see and hear about <laughs> that's a 5G universe. And... How Infineon plays a role in that? Yeah, so um, it's it's a pretty large universe, right? Um, uh, and in fact, I think it was just this morning that the rollout of 5G was supposed to happen within the airline industry. Right? Yes, and that's so, a can of worms. <laughs> yeah, so we won't go there. But um, but but the 5G universe is it is it's it's huge. It's immense. Um, there's so many um, applications and opportunities to take that technology and use it across um, different areas to uh, support and to promote and to make things more convenient, more secure, more. Um, accessible. And so you talked a little bit about manufacturing, right? And so um, look at the semiconductor industry. We're so dependent upon our ability to manufacture devices and get those out to the market. And so being able to use 5G technology to streamline that will further enhance and, and um, optimize, you know, those, those uh, manufacturing needs and requirements. When we talk about um, smart cars, you know, we have sensors and we have uh, memory devices and, and uh, ICs that are used for navigational purposes, um, sensors to ensure that, uh, you know, you have the, your smart parking ability. And so, again, um, really broad applications in, you know, a single uh, end product, you know, the automobile. Yeah. We also have, um, you know, the, the mobile, uh, the wearables, you know, that, that incorporate 5G. And then um, what's really interesting to me, and that's not so much uh, talked about um, in the semiconductor industry, but we're starting to see, and we have been seeing the use of 5G technology. And you spoke to the, you know, the, the benefit of 5G in terms of the low latency, right? You can start using 5G technology, and there's been a lot of experimentation um, doing remote surgery. Yeah. And so, you know, and so you think about the healthcare and the medical industry and the surgical, you know, um, applications that you can incorporate 5G technology to ease that application. So really kind of interesting um, um, 5G coming into the market in terms of just giving uh, society an easier way to apply and, and to live and to work and to communicate. So um it's, I think it's pretty exciting. Um, obviously, there's also, you know, some challenges with 5G um, and some concerns. And, you know, we started off this particular question with the uh, the response and the comment about the airline industry. <laughs> but um, but I think there's probably more benefits than there are challenges or concerns. Absolutely. And I think, you know, this is a, when I say it's a can of worms, I mean, we could get into the details, but I don't want to waste your time with that. We'll cover that on the other side of the podcast. Um, but it's basically a regulatory issue at this point. Uh, technically, I don't think there's a big issue. I think there's a lot of people kind of pointing fingers at one another right now. It'll, it'll, it'll settle down eventually. But speaking of these private 5G networks, um, tell us a little bit, since we're talking automotive, and this is, might be something people can maybe relate to a little better because not everybody has access to a car factory or warehouse. Um, does vehicle to vehicle communication, vehicle to infrastructure communication, are we starting to see uh, a push of using private 5G or peer to peer 5G for this? I know that, you know, obviously uh, there is some standards in place. Like I, I recently drove a Mercedes EQS uh, that had vehicle to infrastructure communication. So in San Francisco, all the traffic lights like basically broadcast a signal. Uh, and this signal can be picked up by the car. This is not the same signal that's being used for emergency services. There's a separate channel for that. 
But it's, it basically told my car on the dashboard how many seconds were left on the traffic lights. It, it did it in every, almost every intersection in San Francisco, and I was kind of blown away by it. So I did what every good journalist does. I went digging on the internet, like, what is this technology? Now, this they're using Wi-Fi, but, you know, some sort of Wi-Fi subset. But I believe that 5G is being touted, you know, it's very been very theoretical, this private 5G stuff, right? So it's been touted for years now by Qualcomm and others. You know, your car can talk to another car directly without hopping through the network because, you know, you want to reduce latency, but also, you know, the, the network might be down and you want those two cars to be able to break at the same time. Is any of that coming to fruition? I mean, obviously, you know, we're still a ways from that being in a standard feature in cars, but it's coming. And are you seeing a lot of push in that direction? You know, this is this is really interesting because um, I remember when I was at a Mobile World Congress three years ago, you know, this mm-hmm. was a topic. Um, this was something that uh, a lot of the companies that you just named, they're touting, you know, this ability. I haven't personally have not heard um, a lot more about that, um, although I do believe and I would assume that there is progress being made because uh, there are initiatives and, and regulations or, or programs that are really pushing um, certain areas of the United States. And I think uh, California is one of the states that, you know, wants to push for um, uh, autonomous vehicles and, or electric vehicles. Um, and they have a target by, I think, 2035 for, to have some percentage of those on the road. So my assumption, um, Miriam, is that we are making progress. I mean, there is a push, right, to to get to that target. So, um, I, I think as far as I know right now, there's no car out there with a 5G connectivity of any kind, whether it's a private or vehicle to vehicle or, uh, you know, connecting to a 5G network just for the infotainment system. I think we're within months of that at this point. I think we're going to start seeing the first 5G equipped cars this year or next. Uh, because uh, especially because uh, a lot of the older networks are being grandfathered out and the companies are learning from this uh, chip supply shortage that they really have to be agile and be able to develop technology more rapidly. So I'm not sure it's necessarily going to be the you know, existing well-established manufacturer going to push it first, but I wouldn't be surprised if a Tesla or a Rivian or a Lucid comes out with an update to their infotainment system that has public 5G connectivity. Um, but that won't have to do anything with the stuff we were talking about just yet. So speaking of this, you know, private 5G stuff we were talking about for, you know, healthcare and and warehouses and, and industry and, and factories and manufacturing, is there any other applications you're seeing that Infineon is involved in uh, with this private 5G stuff? Because, you know, for us, the kind of tech nerdy savvy folk, this private 5G thing is really being just very theoretical, right? Like, do you know for fact of factories running today that are kind of mission critical building products that we all use that are actually using these private networks? Because that's, you know, you don't have to give us examples. I'm just curious. Well, I, you know, in terms of manufacturing, I, I don't have any that I can just kind of roll off my tongue here. Of but another application that's really interesting that uh, we've been using some of our, you know, our products in, and, it, and it's a partnership is with a, an organization called Rainforest Connection. Okay. Um, and they are actually, I think, based in San Francisco, although I, I believe their staff is, is remote um, around the world. And uh, they're using our sensors and technology and to detect uh, wildfires. Okay. And uh, the biodiversity of rainforests to prevent wildfires. And it's it's really kind of interesting because uh, the technology that they're looking at um, and that that they're applying to their product is an Infineon sensor. And so, you know, that's that's another example of how we can take technology like like 5G technology and apply it to to make things you know better within the world. And so it doesn't necessarily always apply to an end product that's an electronic product or a mobile product, but a product that serves in terms of, um, you know, helping with the environment, as an example. So. So again, you know, very broad, very immense, a lot of opportunities out there and using this technology, um, you know, anywhere from, you know, helping from a supply chain and, and manufacturing and 
uh, maximizing and optimizing your operations all the way to, you know, doing your part to ensure that the world is a better place. And when we leave it, it's, it's in a better yeah, place. Yeah. So it sounds like you're telling me basically remote sensing is really becoming a critical part of your business. And that involves everything from the sensors to the power management for the electronics that are regulating and gathering data through these sensors to so maybe some of the uh, electronics for the data connectivity for these sensors. And this is, again, where 5G, and I'd probably, in this case, more public 5G, yeah. is probably mm -hmm. very helpful because... You know, when you're uh, in California here, I don't think we have to go too far. There's a lot of sensors for earthquake detection, for fire detection, uh, for air quality. And these sensors are IoT devices, essentially. They gather data and maybe they ping their servers once an hour and say, here is 10 readings I took in the last hour. We're talking about 10 kilobytes of data, like, you know, something that could easily fit on a floppy disk. But at the same time it's in a very poor reception area, right? And uh, so right now they're using like legacy networks. A lot of it is run through 2G or 3G, maybe even 4G if if it's a pretty new sensor. And that's how they communicate with the servers, right? To, down, to dump that data. And well, you know, this is not real-time critical. So 5G latency is not a huge deal, but 5G penetrates further and is more, you know, is more efficient too. So when you burst that 10 kilobytes of, of sensor data, if you can burst it way faster, your energy use on the device, which is battery powered usually, is much lower, right? So again, Infineon here does power management a lot. So obviously, you know, 5G brings efficiencies to that, right? What people don't understand is that, you know, a 2G or a 3G or 4G radio, other than being inherently less power efficient than 5G simply because technology is newer, is also less efficient because it broadcasts data at a slower rate. So the radios have to be running for a longer time. Like that 10 kilobytes of data over 2G is going to take, you know, 20 seconds to fire into the servers. But on 5G, it's going to literally take a quarter of a second to come out, right? That's and right. so you power that sensor for a quarter of a second, that, 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 you know, remote sensor device, instead of powering it full blast for 20 seconds and now your battery is improved. So you, I think you folks have a lot to do with the technologies behind all this power stuff. And uh, I think a lot of people are just not aware that exists, you know? Yeah, um, and, and we are. We're very much involved in that. And absolutely, as we move to 5G, you've got the power, you've got the connectivity, you have the ability to, um, you know, to uh, transfer a lot more data in a, a shorter amount of time. Um, there's also the, you know, this, this overall speed. So a lot of uh, great benefits there, and we play in that space. I would welcome your your listeners to uh, follow Infineon. Um, we put a lot of information on our social networks and uh, would really uh, invite uh, a little bit more of that learning, you know, through through that network and, and happy to rejoin in the future too with uh, with more of our experts that can go into the nitty gritty for your, you know, for your listeners. Absolutely. So, you know, I will put a link that you will provide to us with uh, all this access to all the social media and all the other information. Basically, folks, if you're listening to this and you want to know more, check out the link in the show notes. There'll be a, one of the very first links will be uh, to an Infineon uh, landing page. And I want to ask you one last question because we have some time and because oh, yeah. it is on everybody's mind. And, you know, it's more a kind of, I'm checking in on Infineon and I want your feeling, like I'm feeling very positive about this problem in it, that it will resolve itself eventually. But where are we at with the chip shortage? How is it affecting your business and how is it affecting the industry that you focus on right now? Is it a big problem? Are you guys anticipated it and you were ready for it and everything's cool and peachy? Well, Infineon, um, we have a number of uh, fabs and manufacturing um, applic uh, in ma manufacturing uh, sites. Um, so we're able to manage that as well as we can, but certainly it's been tough, not just for us, but everyone in the industry. I mean, it's all over the news. It's, you know, in your news feed, it's on the, in the papers. Um, so the chip shortage um, is, is a challenge uh, for, for all of us um, who are supplying the chips, um, you know, COVID, I think also uh, further exasperated, you know, that challenge. 
But I have to say that the way we've been managing um, this is we've been working very closely with our customers and our partners to uh, get as much as we can get to deliver to our customers um, to meet their demands. Um, our, I have to say that our customers have also been very helpful in partnering with us. And, um, and our employees have done a tremendous job in terms of keeping the lights on 24 seven to ensure that we try to keep everything on track and where, <laughs> you know, where we can, we can, um, we can provide more, but, but certainly it, it has been, you know, it has been a challenge. Well, I'm glad to hear that you are making it work, though. I mean, obviously, I'd expect that, but I think it's, uh, you know, I've heard from other companies and it's more of a challenge for them, not some, not because they're not managing it, but because their customers are having a hard time. So they end up having to be kind of like handholders, you know, to their customers because they're they're chip specialists. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's definitely a challenge, but I, I feel pretty positive. I think that, you know, we'll just have to figure it out. And once we do, we'll be more, we'll be more resilient for the future. You know, it's not just COVID. There is all the issues around the environment and, you know, political things yep. that uh, can cause, you know, a shortage of or disruption of transportation manufacturing and we need to be ready for that and and i think this is what we're learning in this de decade of of our timeline you know a kind of a meta subject of of uh of mobile here really that uh you know for us to continue enjoying our phones uh industries are and our cars industries are adapting very quickly correct yes and and I, you know and and talk about chip shortages okay so we're seeing shortages across the board Right. Not not just within chips um, in the semiconductor oh, yeah. industry, but I mean, you've got the labor shortage, you have shortage in retail, you have shortage, you know, food shortage. And there's just so much that's going on in terms of challenges for um, for every single industry out there. Um, and so there there is um, there is kind of this uh, uh, what you call it, like this metaverse of shortages. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Well, listen, Judy, uh, we have to wrap it up. I really appreciate you being on the show and telling us more about what Infineon does and how you're weathering the storm and some of the cool projects that you've been helping with. This stuff in the Amazon was really surprising and welcome to hear from, from me. And so uh, thanks again for being on the show. We'll hopefully have you on at some point in the future. And folks, we're going to continue now with Jaime. Thanks, Judy. Thank you, Miriam, and thank you to your listeners. So, Jaime, you're here now. I am here. How's it going? It could not be better. I just came back from CES. <laughs> yes. Everyone, Jaime Rivera of Pocket Now. So, we covered CES quite extensively the last two shows. Michael Fisher was actually my guest for CES. Oh, really? And we decided, you know, since we're not there, we might as well uh, do something together. But as you can see, we're in that weird between CS and MWC time, right? Where everybody's freaking out and running around with their heads cut off because leaks are everywhere. Oh, yeah. Like, this is going to be a leaks and rumors show, basically, at this oh, point. Oh, you, you mean my kind of show? Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> and to be honest with you, this is a little trick that my audience should know about. How I gather what I'm going to cover during the week is in part, because I do it multiple sources, but in part by watching the Pocket Now Daily. Thank you. Appreciate right? it. Because you always have all the stuff. And you made it easy for me because, you know, I try to get a variety of links from various publications in my podcast notes, but I try to prioritize my guests' publications. So I just had to click on the links that were in the Pocket Now <laughs> Daily <laughs> and pick the ones I thought were cool and just put them in the show notes. Thanks, Jaime. That just made I it easy. I start the show by there are no official news today. It is rumor day. Let's do this. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so let's start with the first rumor. Look, I just put them in some order. I, I start with Samsung because, well, it's, it's very close. Like, we're very close. What is there left that we don't already I know? I mean, so let's price leak. Let's start with that because, you know, here's what I want to know. You, you just reviewed the S21 fan edition, or at least you got your hands yeah, on it. Yeah, I have to. My review is going to be done over the weekend, yeah. And you know how... There's a lot of kind of, there's most people are saying buy a Pixel 6, it's $100 less mm -hmm. and you're, you're getting, in some ways you're getting a better phone. And and Dave 2D did a video saying, no, I think people are wrong. I think that it's a different experience. And if you really want, you should, you should look at it. It's going to come down in price really fast. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, Michael was like, well, you know, you can buy an S21, like 
discounted right now for if you want a slightly smaller phone, why would you buy an F? So my take is it's a little overpriced. I think it should be the same price as the Pixel 6. But the reason I'm bringing all this up is to kind of, you know, discuss what the S22 pricing is going to be. But I feel like the S21 fan is going to drop really quickly. Oh, yeah. And and then it's going to, I think it's a great phone. Like I don't have one yet, but I know that I'm getting one soon and I've played with the S20 fan edition last year. And I think the cameras on that sis, on that phone might not be the best specs, but they're so, you know, it's like the Pixel 4 and 5 and 5A and 4A. It's like the same sensor for so long that I think Samsung just knows what to do. There. Yes, but I think that the S20 fan edition was more to the A51 of the time and not right. more to the S20. Like if you saw the screen... If you saw the cameras, you saw the the performance of that. Like the phone, I think that that phone was too expensive for what you got. Um, and honestly, I think that the S21 Fan Edition is more to the S21. Yeah, it's better. Yeah, it's for a sure. dramatically better phone. Like dramatically better. Like the moment you turn it on and you actually see the dynamic see that 2X, screen? I'm like, oh, shoot. Yeah, no. And it's slightly larger. It's slightly chunkier. So it feels better. It has mm. much better battery life. It comes with oh. Android 12 out of the box. And I actually am more of a fan of direct pixel shots than of pixel binning. And so what they did was remove the, yeah. that 64 megapixel, go for the 8, which is what you were getting oh, yeah. anyways. I've always hated the 64 with a 1.1 optical. Like, yeah. Who does that? Cropping a, six, a sensor with such small pixels doesn't make any sense Exactly, whatsoever. exactly. And so I, I actually think that this is a better, it's like a middle child between the S21 and the S21 Plus, in, but that's priced at less money, you know, retail when yeah, compared yeah. to the S21. Yeah. So honestly, I think it's a really good phone. I, I was well, shocked. Well, I feel the same way. See, this is kind of where I'm going. I'm kind of agreeing with Dave 2D. If it was, I'd be happier if it was the same price as the Pixel 6 because then I could really say 100% go for the Samsung. But at the same time, right now, I feel like a lot of people are just like, I think if you use that phone, and again, you have it, but I don't yet. But my gut tells me this is a great phone. Now, prices are going to drop. Yeah. And then how do you feel about the S21 Fan Edition versus the Pixel 6? Because obviously the Pixel 6 doesn't have a telephoto, but that super res zoom is pretty damn great. Uh, but I, I still have a, like, I still feel that you can't beat physics. I feel that, com you know, Google is doing an amazing job, but it still is not like, it's not just, you, you remember that it's not just uh, the topic of, more, you know, the super res zoom. It's the fact that you don't technically get the same focal approach like a telephoto yeah. that's tuned for those millimeters will provide a completely different photo oh, for than sure. just cropping yeah. into a shot it's not going to give oh, yeah. you the same street photography feel it, no. that you'll it's a depth of field thing exactly it's a like i love telephotos i i me too i enjoy the results for street photography and so i i just feel that I feel that it's $100 less expensive in the case of the Pixel, and I feel that it should be because you're getting less cameras. You know, te exactly. Tensor is still something that we're getting used to. It is right. buggy AF. Like, oh my God. There have been... My, I have a pro, and it's it's a challenge sometimes. Exactly, and, and it's just been so... It's been this like sort of experiment that I'm glad that Google is doing, but then I feel that because of that, I, you know, if I would compare them, obviously it's a value proposition, I would probably pick... I would actually pick the S21. I just feel it gives you a lot more for a little bit more money. All right. Well, based on that, let's talk about the pricing of the S22 because it's interesting. I also want to point out, since you love telephotos, I have an Xperia 5 Mark III Ooh, here finally. Nice. I'm reviewing for hot hardware. And, you know, it's an old phone. It's nine months old. I never got the one Mark III to play with, so it's that, that new variable or two-step telephoto is new to me. Yeah. And, man... I don't know what people are complaining about. That is a good camera system. Yeah. It's not Pixel. It's not iPhone. It's not Samsung. It's not mash away and you get a great photo. But you don't, even in staying in full, like easy mode, like the basic mode, yeah. I feel like it's it delivers. And that telephoto, man, I mean, the f-stops aren't great, but the bokeh and the creaminess of the lens system, that Zeiss T-Star, oh man. Well, I think that people should remember that if you really want, you know, aperture, to those the f-stops to be decent, you kind of need a lot of glass for that. Like, you can't, yeah. you can't ask a phone. Like, my telephotos are freaking massive. 
they just are. And if you want persistent aperture, they're even bigger. And so it just... It, I'm going to quote you on that. This is going to be a tweet. My telephotos are... Yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're massive. And so let, let's just be real. Like, you, we, you, the, you, you just can't provide that with, with, with software just yet. There's no... Like, in the case of the phone, you have to prioritize the size of the phone. And here's the thing. I actually like Sony photography. I'm going to be the weirdo. Oh, me too. I'm a huge That'll tell fan. you that, you know, even in their cameras, they're no, they don't have the Canon color, but... They've got this like I don't know I don't know what it is that they're doing with their new tuning of skin tones that I really like. It's warmer. I don't know. It, it feels a little a little more contrasty, and I actually enjoy it. And I feel that they're bringing that to their experience. It's nowhere close to Pixel, indeed. But I feel that it's no, going in the right but direction. But it's a, it's a different experience. Like I went into it based on my one Mark II experience that I reviewed last. That's the last one I reviewed. Right. And I was kind of like, yeah, it's good, but you really have to know what you're doing to really get the stuff out of it. True. And then I'm using this one now. And of course, it's a nine-month-old phone now in the rest of the world. So it's gotten updates and improvements. Yeah. And so we're getting a really well-sorted version of it here in the US. And I'm like, holy crap. Like, I'm not so super excited about the ultra-wide and the main sensor on that. Mm -hmm. But the telephoto system on that camera from an optical perspective, whew, yeah. hot and sexy. Right. And so it's, it's, here's the thing. It's the same case with like, you know, going back to the case of Samsung. I mean, have you seen their night mode? Yeah. I, I, I don't know about you, but I was able to get sort of astrophotography results from that S21 oh, yeah. FE yesterday without having to wait two minutes to get my photo. Yeah. Because you only have, you know, 12 megapixels to deal with. Right. And you don't have to do all that extra computing. Look, I'm, I am very much torn. Like I've, I've said this on the record on the show before. I feel that for the main sensor, mm -hmm. because Google is new to this new big sensor they're using. Yeah. The the older sensor, I think, is better results. Sure, the depth of field is not as oh, of tasty and delicious, but I feel like in terms of pure image processing, yeah, I would rather take a photo on the main sensor, the five A. Then on the main sensor of the 6 or 6 Pro. However, that 5A is such a good phone. It's such a good phone. Oh my God. It's so well tuned. It's, <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Every time I'm like happy with a Pixel 6 photo and I'm all like, oh, ooh. and then I pull out the 5A and I take a few photos. I'm like, no, no, no. But as soon as I hit the telephoto, on the uh, on the 6 Pro, of course, that, that telephoto yeah. is pretty sweet. It's pretty sweet. So, Oh man, yeah, I'm kind of with you. I'm like, and that's kind of why this Sony is interesting to me because it's not binning in any way. Kind of like the FE, yeah, uh, S21 FE, and then of course the S22. So the S22, we know kind of what the camera specs are going to look like, and we know yeah. what the pricing. So let's talk about the price. The price rumor is what eight ninety nine. One hundred dollars more expensive, eight ninety nine. Eight ninety nine. So a hundred dollar more than this past phone's MSRP. Yeah which is discounted all over the place already. Like it's been- What do I think? Here's the thing. I think that no company does trade in deals better than Samsung. So honestly, yeah. it's, it's I, you know, even if they tell you that it's $1,800 to get a Z Fold 3, you can get a, the cheapest broken down iPhone and get so much money back from Verizon. Do you want to hear the story that I got for this? What did you do, darling? I bought my Z Flip 3 for 180 bucks. I know. It's just... <laughs> and so, like, I'm sure that the rest of the world has an old phone. And Samsung is the most benevolent company for trade-ins. And so it's one of those things where, yes, I know they're making it more expensive. I'm hoping that they back it up. I mean, if the S21 FE is this good... Uh, I'm really curious to know what they what they plan to do with their new lineup, particularly when their foldables are making such a statement. Um, yeah. Like these have to be amazing flat phones, and so you, I, you, you know, I, I, I think that I if, mean, if they're going to charge more, I'm sure that they're going to throw something in there. And if they don't, which I doubt they won't, darling, I mean, if they're going to give me a trade in deal where I could pretty much get the S20, the S22 for free, which is what they usually do. Like it's it's gonna be really hard to argue with that value proposition, what they which they always do. For sure. Yeah. I mean, for me, the thing here is that, you know, look at the prices. So they want to say eight ninety nine. So it's basically a hundred dollars more across the board. Eight ninety nine yeah. for the S twenty two, a thousand ninety nine for the S twenty two plus, and twelve ninety nine for the S twenty two Ultra. If they're giving us something particularly juicy 
to make up for that. I'm okay with it because, as you said, within days of it being announced, we're going to get incredible deals, trade-ins, yeah. BOGOs, through the carrier or through Samsung. And then even if you want to buy without trade, within weeks, there will be discounts, right? They always have some kind of right. discount. And so think about it. If we're honest, an iPhone 13 is not $799. It's $829. Right. So that is the price of it. You get one less camera. I hate that they do that. Uh, you get one I less camera. Do you don't have high refresh rate on on the on the base thirteen models. You have to go pro, and so it's it's one of those things where, you know, it, it's it's like the same of the case of the Pixel Six. Like you're getting juicy one hundred and twenty hertz on the S twenty one FE right now. So again, yeah, I can only like I can't I can't. Nobody has talked about the display panels we're getting on these new S22s. And I doubt that they're going to put the same screen on the S22 that we're getting with the S21 FE. Yeah, it's got to be better. And then it means it's going to be even more mind-blowing. Exactly. Like, we've been doing 5 million to 1 contrast ratio on Oppo phones for two generations, which Samsung has not adopted. And those Find X smartphones, ha those screens look amazing, which I'm shocked. They're incredible. I'm shocked that Samsung hasn't used their own con that that their own technology for their own galaxy. I thought there was the same display on the S21 Ultra. No, no it's 2 million to 1. Ah, it's 2 million to 1, which is iPhone 13 territory. And wow. so I don't know why Oppo like cut the deal. I think, you know what, this might be a durability issue. I think Oppo is going all out and you're going to get more burn-in because of the high contrast you think ratio so? after two, yeah. I mean, Coleds are still burning in. I don't mind, I don't care because I change phones often enough, but yeah. It's a real problem, especially at high contrast. And I think Samsung's trying to, you know, kind of prevent that somewhat. And also, look, you know, we've seen what's happening with iPhones and Galaxies in the US, at least. People are hanging on to them longer. Yeah. Like, honestly, my S21 Ultra, which is a review unit, um, I'm using it as kind of my main camera phone for, especially for shooting cars, because yeah. of the super ultra wide that it has and the really great telephoto options. Yeah. And... You know, I'm like, do I would I really need anything better than this? Like at this point, in terms of imaging, it's the most versatile phone I have. Like it it's is. the most versatile phone you have. Not for video because my iPhone does video. Because you can't use your P40 Pro Plus. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, but I mean, it, it, if I feel it, you know, it's like I'm like I'm. If I had bought that phone with my own money, I cannot imagine me even plunking any money down on any of these phones right now. Yeah. Because it's like, there's just no point. And I think that's kind of where we're at with these phones. So what do we know about the camera systems on the non-Ultra version of the S22 so we, Plus? We did get a leak yesterday, I think it was, that was yeah. like juicy about like the fact that they really want to go hard, like that they finally plan to change the camera system. But it, it's kind of confusing because the tweet where the leak came from kind of points to you getting 108 megapixel results from the standard models, but then it sort of says that you're going to do Nona binning, sort of like the 108 megapixel shots yeah. that you get yeah. on the Ultra, but then we hear that the camera spec is only 50 megapixels. And so... I think the, the ultra wide is 50 is what I'm hearing. I, yeah, so I I, I don't know. It is kind of confusing. I And, that, and that's the problem. Like right now... At this point, all the press renders are ready, like all this information. Oh, yeah. And so it, it kind of threw me off. Like it would make sense if Samsung is betting so hard on these foldables, they have to make all the cameras on the S22 amazing in order for these to be like the P series smartphones for Samsung. These are their camera phones. And then end of year, they're doing their foldable Vanguard no holds yeah. barred technology 100%. smartphones and so these have to be their p's like you know the huawei where they had their mate which was their new technology but not necessarily the best camera phones and then these are their photography phones so what if they do have a 108 megapixel sensor in there but it's not the top line one it's not the one that's in the ultra could be or in the in the old ultra the s21 ultra could be because they have a whole line now of 108 megapixel yeah, sensors. exactly. I think there are they have some three. that have been four to one. There yeah. are some that have been nine to one. Um, and so, you know, I'm thinking maybe what we're getting here is a slightly detuned or maybe a new sensor based on one of these sensors that is more affordable 
but still better than the cheaper 108 ones. You know what I'm saying? Could be. And I wouldn't be surprised if they it will have a 50 megapixel ultra wide in there. Could be. Because I, I would. And then the 12 megapixel supposedly is a telephoto, or maybe maybe they don't have a telephoto because they're going to count on the 108 megapixel to give us a zoom. Could be. And think about it. It like what makes a pro. What do pro photographers want? Like if you're buying a Sony A7 Mark IV, what are you looking for? You want those, like you want that 50 megapixel, what is it, 48 megapixel full frame sensor. Why do you want it? You want those megapixels on a regular shot for you to crop the hell out of it. Yeah, But you totally. can't get it out of a 12 megapixel shot, which is what Apple's been prioritizing for years. You mm -hmm. actually want, I actually want one of these companies to not just give me those 108 megapixels. I want a pro mode that makes access to that the full capability of that sensor to be accessible to me so that I can pick if I want to telephoto whatever I want, which is going to give me yeah. a different aspect, or if I want to actually just do a digital crop from an 108 megapixel shot. And historically, Samsung hasn't really done an amazing job at giving me an easy pro mode that will, like, you have to dig into settings, pick everything, and I don't want that. I want two buttons that are like, you want binning or you want you know, you want sensor size, 108 megapixels. Right. If you've got enough light, then why, you know, you don't need to yeah. deal with the Nona binning if you've got the light for it. And it's up right. to you to determine that as a pro photographer, quote unquote. Yeah, a lot of Chinese phones are like that. Like the Xiaomi phones always have a full resolution mode in yeah. pro. Yeah. And even I'll put raw at that level. So it gets really interesting, but it's not necessarily two, two steps away either. Right. So the other thing that, might affect the camera is the processor. And obviously <laughs> it took a few days there. It was a little rocky for, you know, a while, but the Exynos 2200 has been finally announced. I know. After them completely ignoring the original deadline that they'd set for themselves and us all freaking out going, are they just going to like, you know, completely like ignore this? But that's you and me freaking out because people in India oh, were celebrating. People in oh, India really? and the UK were celebrating. They were like, we were, we're yeah, they're finally getting Snapdragon. Getting Snapdragon. <laughs> this X and O's. And here's the problem. Like, if you were if you were to look at the leaked benchmarks, apparently, you know, th there are two conflicting rumors. One is that the set that the processor is not as great as the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1. And then we've got another leak that says that graphics power is actually better because of that whole AMD collaboration. AMD RDNA 2. Right. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, I'm buying that. You think? Yeah, because look, we know what Tensor is. Tensor is an okay CPU, Yeah. a decent GPU. In this case, we're going to get a great GPU, but the focus was on the NPU, the, exactly. the actual machine learning uh, neural network stuff. Right. The AI stuff. This might have a good AI setup and a good CPU, passable, just fine CPU setup. Right. But is putting all the eggs into the, you know, in the graphics side. And maybe it's it's okay and maybe it's not. My biggest problem with this is that when you use a Galaxy with an Exynos versus a Galaxy with a Snapdragon, you get a different imaging You experience. get different. You get a different quality of image. It's a completely different ISP. And that is what sucks because I hate to say it that, but because even though I don't feel like, you know, Qualcomm has the best ISPs and the best imaging pipeline yeah. that they offer to OEMs. You know, obviously Google's done very well with that, like adding their their secret, secret sauce on it. Xiaomi's added their secret sauce. Oppo and BBK Group have added their secret sauce to varying results. I think Oppo is definitely the best. Vivo is doing a fantastic job. Yeah. But as you notice, this past year, a lot of the Vivo and Oppo phones are starting to ship with their Immediate own ISPs. Or, you know, no, yeah, you're right. Their own ISP on right? top of the chip. And so what that tells me is that, you know, of course the Snapdragon 1 is going to be better than the Exynos because there's more people out there coding their image pipeline on these chips because they're so popular. Yeah. Exynos is just, you know, Samsung essentially. Maybe if there's a few Exynos phones from Moto and whatever, but they're not high-end ones. So the result is you're always going to get a better imaging experience from a chip that's popular. You're the expert here, darling. I mean, I think that Samsung only did full Exynos with the Galaxy S6. Um, yeah. And and it was because that Snapdragon 810 was, you know, was a, a heat he magnet. <laughs> <laughs> yes. if, if you remember that one. Um, oh, yeah. But I'm like, how does this help? Because, you know, right now, you know, application developers, they're struggling to be able to 
code for Android phones, given the bevy of chips, the bevy of code that they have to adapt for. And so they're literally emulating everything. And therefore, the results that we're getting out of these phones for social media applications is trash compared to an iPhone. And True. I'm, I'm sorry, you cannot convince my 21-year-old or my 15-year-old daughter to use the best Galaxy phone, regardless of the photography prowess and everything. If they want their photos, they don't want to print them out. Like, there is no consumer no. left on this planet that wants to take photos out of the phone to go print them out. Or if they're, they're probably five, uh, raise your hands if you're here. Everyone wants their photos for social media. Like, wouldn't it be better for Samsung to just say, you know what, for the Ultras, we're going to use Snapdragon 8 Gen 1. Doesn't matter where you buy it. For And then for the other variants, we're going to use Exynos. It would. And just it to make would, but I feel that what's happening here is that there's only so much, there's a supply and demand issue in many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, they, you know, first of all, they, they're putting a lot of R&D money in these, their own chips for whatever reason. Maybe it's a Korean pride thing. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like they, they, they sometimes do weird stuff like that. Remember yeah. how stubborn LG was in the past <laughs> and how there's no more LG and, how, and we're all kind of no sad more. because damn, the wing was such a cool phone, even though it was completely no impractical. It was super cool. The point is that I think Samsung stuck in that thing where part of the company says we need to continue making SOCs. And then then they make so many phones that they realize we can't make them all with Snapdragon 8 Gen 1. Yeah. We just don't have enough yield. So what do we do? Well, let's get some Exynos phones out there. And it sucks because, you know, the a lot of markets, China in particular, and the US, of course, are essentially Qualcomm, right? Yeah. Like, like that's all they'll do. Yeah. Um, so pretty much if you look. And so that's a, that's the biggest, that's a huge part. So Europe is kind of like very chill about, you know, the European operators and the European regulatory, um, whatever the, the governments are a bit more chill about, you know, not using Snapdragon stuff for 5G, but you know how it is. Like in the US, that's, it's almost impossible to launch a MediaTek phone. No, right? exactly. <laughs> I'm shocked that they have. But yeah, I mean, no. they have because they're they're really pushing it, and I'm good for them. I I'm supporting in that, but I, I think it's a, that's part of the problem as well. You know, we'll see, we'll see. Because I I do like I. It's funny. I mock like the comment, and it's not that I mock the comments, but every time that I'm going to talk about the Exynos 2200, I know that people are going to go crazy in the comments for every single video that I do, and therefore I am like, for all of you celebrating that there has not been an announcement for the Exynos 2200, <laughs> I am sad to report that it just did. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> well, I mean, it's there. Let's see what happens. Maybe Samsung will surprise us, and there will not be an Exynos 2200 Galaxy and listen, S22. Listen, I mean, if Apple can figure out how to make a better chip than everyone, not being a chip company, like, think about it. If Apple could figure it out, it, if Google's first attempt with Tensor, Tensor was, let's be real, I mean, it wasn't, If it's their first chip. But it's a Samsung chip, you know? I mean, ultimately, they're using building block, Lego block from Samsung to right, build this. Right, right. Which is fine, but it's not from scratch. Apple really bought a semiconductor company back way back when, and now we have the M1 chip, right? True. Like, I mean, this is kind of where we're at. Like, it's a decade of them developing their own chip from scratch. Samsung's doing that too, but I don't think they have quite the bright minds that Apple does, I'm sorry to say. And then Qualcomm has the bright minds, have you gotten an M1 yet? I have not a pro model. I have the, the Air M1 and it's still running circles around this iMac that I'm using that's only two years old. Oh Completely my God. obliterates it. Oh my God. I want a pro, but I don't need it right now. So no, the next no, computer. No, you don't need, all you need is the, the MacBook Air. Yeah, so I have an Air M1 and it's, I have the one with a bit more storage and RAM. It's amazing. It's, it's unreal how good it is. It's amazing. <laughs> like, it's, it's, like, it's so hard to argue with that. So I was in Palm Springs like two weeks ago because, you know, we always do our post CS Palm Springs trip right. and we did it anyway. Right. And I'm like editing the podcast on that thing. And I'm like, why am I still using my iMac? Like, can I turn my iMac into a display? I could in the old days, you can do that. I but know. they've removed that feature now, so I can't, through Thunderbolt, use it as a display. Otherwise, in, in a heartbeat, I'd be using this you know, this thing as a display instead of using it. Like, it's a Core i5 with 16 gigs of RAM, 
and it's fine, but you give it a little bit too much to do and it just chokes. No, it's, like it just comes it's to so bad. I have not managed to slow down my M1 in any way, shape, or form. And every time I look at the battery icon, I'm like, you know, yeah, like tapping are you on there? it going, like, like is hello? the gauge stuck? Hello, hello? <laughs> are you there? Like, no, I have been, I have been using, uh, sadly, I've been Honduras, which by the way is the reason for, for all the craziness. Um, but like, oh my God, I started using this computer at 9 a.m. and it's currently 3.44 p.m. and it's still at 81% battery and I've already yeah. edited a video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, it's like, uh, it's, it's a miracle thing. And my computer is now over a year old and I don't use it a lot. So it spends a lot of time, you know, kind of idling on its battery, like in the sense of it, it's like, it's, it's, it's sitting in my bag unused for a week at a time at whatever, 80%, 60%, a hundred percent. Yeah. And that's, we all know that's not good for lithium ion batteries. Lithium ion batteries are happiest when they exercise. It's like yeah. your lungs, right? Yeah. The more you work out, the happier your lungs are. The lung capacity is bigger. Right. Well, lithium ions are like that. They like to be worked out. So I'm still getting incredible performance, even after a year of not really using the battery the best way I should use it. And so that's just making me so hopeful about the future. But back to what we we're talking, I think like, Samsung doesn't have the the minds and Qualcomm does and Apple does. And, you know, I think Huawei did yeah, uh, yeah. and, and, or still does, but can't do anything with it. And this is where we're at. And so I think I'm really hoping this S22 comes out with eight gen one across the board and we get the 2200 on the A series or whatever it might be, maybe some tablets. I'll oh, put that on some tablets. Yeah. You know, whatever. <laughs> like we, we want more GPU on the tablets. Of course we do. That is a good idea, actually. We're going to quote <sighs> anyway. you on that. Yeah, well. We're going to be like Miriam said it. <laughs> do you want to move on to the Pixel Fold rumors? Well, the design leaks the, the, came the, out. The fact that they're back. Have you used the I'm, Find Then, by the way? Oh, I have one and I love it. It's my favorite foldable so far. I, I love it and I don't. And I and I don't because Android is so bad at, oh, right. at landscape mode, and it's forcing all the features and the keyboard to work in landscape mode. And I can I have not figured for the life of me how to make SwiftKey not give me the keyboard that I don't want it to give me the variation uh. of the landscape keyboard that I can just not disable. And so it's it's one of those things where I'm like, I love the Find Then. I adore, this is the form factor. This is how it should yeah. be. A shorter phone that clamps the way it does. It is so good. And yet the moment, well, that's, you know, one thing is the forcing you to landscape mode. The second thing is, and, and it's an Android thing, really. But the second it's thing an is, thing. the second thing is that camera hump looks so cool, but the photos don't. And I'm like. Yeah. Yeah. It's not as seemingly as the Find X3 Pro, which I used for a while as my main phone. Oh, the Find X3 Pro, it, it's it's amazing. But here's the thing. I, I am optimistic for Google coming up with a Pixel Fold that mimics the Find Den. I think that that is the sweet spot form factor. But I really like for every, whatever Google designer that's currently listening to this podcast right now, just do us a favor and just get your act together. Like it's been, <laughs> when did the Motorola Zoom come out? What was that, 2012? <laughs> Yeah, it's more than a decade ago. It's like, a decade ago. Can you do me a favor and just get your act together? Like, like your best tablet, the best Android tablet that ever existed was the Nexus 7 and still is. That is the best Android tablet and it was a vertical form factor. And it just is like iPads are vertical and you can use them horizontal for content consumption if you want, but they're primarily vertical. And so can we just figure that part out and give people a good vertical experience on their tablets and people are going to be happy. How about that? Yeah, I agree with you. I'm just annoyed with the fact that there is no, every time I use one of those folding phones that turns into a tablet or an Android tablet of some kind, I'm not getting the experience I want. Like I'm not, like right now the fine end, the reason I love it is because when it's opened, I use it as a bigger phone. Like I'm not even trying to multitask and take advantage of any of the left and right stuff. You know, like some people are putting apps on the left and right and doing all, I'm not even bothering with that. I'm just using it. Like, oh, look, I got more real estate to scroll and my fonts are bigger and I can see better. But I'm actually using it closed a lot too because that front display Yeah, the front display is, is really perfectly usable. usable. It, looks like it, you know, it looks like a 13 mini pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I, I like it. So I, I don't know. I, I like the design leak. I just, 
I really feel that Android, just they really just need to figure themselves out. Like, come on. I, I even feel that Material U is like, I, I hate the design. I, and I hate it. And I'm like, listen, it's, there's nothing wrong with your beautiful icons. Let's just cut the BS. It's not about me. You came up with some really sweet icons. And welcome to 20, what? What is it? 2016 Samsung theming where you can actually change the color and the aspect of how everything is going to work. Like this was even available in Windows Mobile 6 for Christ's sakes. So you can't yeah. tell me that this is anything new. What I really want, if you want this to be material me, I need to use this canvas better. You're giving me this massive Pixel 6 Pro with the worst screen real estate implementation in history. Yep. And, and so I'm like, this phone is massive and your software makes it feel even worse. You want a massive screen where you can do more with it. And it's it's the reason why, whether we like it or not, is the Find Den the best form factor? Yes, but is the best implementation for a foldable, any Samsung foldable, that's Better. why. Be yep. simply because their software is more dense and you can actually do more with it. I feel like if I'm using a 13 Pro Max every time I, I pull out the Pixel 6 Pro and I just, I, I start using it that I'm like, ah, oh, no, Matias, come on. Yeah. <laughs> you were the chosen one. <laughs> <laughs> you were the one that was supposed to bring balance to the force. But anyways. <laughs> Um, for those of you who don't listen to the whole podcast till the end, if you want to see a video version of this podcast, consider joining the Patreon, patreon.com slash TNKGRL. That's patreon.com slash TNKGRL. There's other tiers there, but that one of the tiers is you get the video version more rough and tumble, less edited, and you get it before the audio version, before the public mm. one. So yeah, it's exciting. And you get to see Jaime's beautiful face. Look, I think the Pixel Fold, it's coming clearly. I'm hoping that they, you're right. I'm hoping the form factor is right, but I'm hoping the software just, somehow they make it work better for us. Right. I'm not holding my breath because uh, it's the same as you said. As much as I love my Google Pixel experience, there are so many things in there that feel really broken to me. Right. That I'm just like, uh, but. You want to know where material you make sense on the Pixel 5? Yes. If you use a small Pixel 5 with material you, it, it works perfectly. Not on the. I actually six. think the Pixel Six Pro is a phone is too big. It's just too big. It like I. Tried, it's bigger than S twenty one Ultra. Listen, I tried using the iPhone twelve Pro Max for a year, and then I ended up with pinky strain. I am like, <laughs> like I I, I listen. I, I'm like yep. I I'm I. I know that your design of the 12 Pro and now 13 Pro is a beautiful phone. It's gorgeous. But blowing things up doesn't really necessarily provide the best experience. It's like, uh, you know, the iPad Pro in 12.9. Just blowing things up doesn't really add value. No. I get it that some people want a larger canvas, but they don't just want a larger canvas. They actually want to take advantage of that larger canvas for a reason. It's the reason yeah. why you get a 16-inch MacBook Pro over a 14-inch. You want yeah. the canvas for a purpose. You don't just want bigger text. And if you don't have an, op an operating system that can adapt to that larger form factor, then you're just giving me a blown up iPhone. How is that any better than using a mini? I actually even did the, experience, the experiment of stacking them next to each other to see which phone gave me more, Pixel 5 or Pixel 6 Pro, iPhone 13 mini or iPhone 13 Pro Max. And they're almost the same experience. Yeah. On a I know. blown up canvas, it makes no sense. So if they do, if they do that with the Pixel Fold, I think they're going to screw it up. Yeah, unfortunately, I, f I feel that for the first gen, it'll be not perfect. I do feel that some folks, I'm kind of almost in that camp simply because I have really shitty eyes. Uh, it's nice <laughs> to have to be able to blow up my fonts. I usually set my font size to large on my Android phone, so. You know, I think that, but it's too big. It's still, as, as you said, it's still not optimal enough on the Pixel 6 Pro. I'm, I'm keep pointing there because it's on my Pixel stand charging. Anyway, Fine X5 Pro Hasselblad branding. Let's have a more of a meta conversation. I don't oh, care God. so much about the Fine X5 Pro. I'm more concerned about what's going on with the Oppo and OnePlus. Like this is a whole, <laughs> I, where, like, where are they going? Like, you know, Super VOOC now on the OnePlus 10 and and now Hasselblad branding on the Fine X5 Pro. L listen, I, I want to believe in what Pete Lau is doing, but this is getting ridiculous. I, I had a conversation with their PR, who's a really good friend of mine, really close friend. Here's the funny part. I have a sweet spot in my heart for Oppo because I think that that was like the first close PR relationship that I ever had. And I still consider them to be the best. 
Um, and then I have a sweet spot for OnePlus because I feel that they always had consumers back since the launch of the OnePlus One, OnePlus sure. Two. Like I feel that no company represented the consumer better than OnePlus. And so the, wh- the, the, it makes no sense for me to not be happy with this transition. It makes no sense for me to not, it's the best of all worlds colliding into one. And yet yeah. for some reason, it's like if they've fallen off the radar. And then this launch that they did with the OnePlus 10 Pro is just so weird that I don't understand it. That's exactly what I'm saying. Like I, we all know the specs about the Find X5 Pro. We've covered that on the show multiple times. There's more leaks all the time and that's great. It's looking like it's gonna be very much an evolution of the Find X3 Pro, but we're gonna lose that microscope, which is, yeah. For some people, no big deal, but I thought it was cool. For me, it's no big no, deal. No, for me as well. I don't really care, although I thought it was cool. But the bottom line here is I'm more like, okay, OnePlus 10 Pro comes out in China first. Now, we're rumors that it's not until March yeah. that we're going to get the global version, right? Yeah. I think it's a chip shortage play to a certain degree, but at the same time, I think that they're... I, I'm just trying to understand what Oppo is trying to do with OnePlus because you and I have been to their factory. Like we've always known yeah. that they're literally in one corner of the building and then the other is in the other corner. <laughs> and then and the other so, corner is Realme and then the other corner is Vivo. Exactly. And everybody depends on BBK and they're doing great. They're doing great work. But here's the problem. I sat down with my, you know, with my buddy from Oppo, from OnePlus PR and I'm like, you know, you should have had Hasselblad pay you guys. They owe you 150 million for like bringing their brand back. Because to be fully honest with you, the average millennial and Gen Z, they don't care about the fact that the first photos of the moon were taken with the Hasselblad. They have right. no idea what medium format is, and none of them is going to pay ten thousand dollars for one of those cameras. So no. I am trying to understand. Except for ML. <laughs> <laughs> so I am trying to understand how was OnePlus benefited by this Hasselblad partnership. It's the other way around. You guys finally brought Hasselblad bar- back to the spotlight. But you know what the problem is? That if I grab your Find X3 Pro and I put it next to the OnePlus 9 Pro, where your OnePlus 9 Pro has a better primary sensor, by by size and by pixel size and everything compared to the Find X3 Pro. How could it be that the Find X3 Pro is taking better photos? Right. It makes no logical sense, except for the fact that your Oppo team clearly has had more time to tune this camera than your OnePlus team with this whole merger with Hasselblad. So am I worried about the partnership? Of course I am. I am because I am yeah. like, listen, listen, Miriam, I have been using Oppo phones for photography I think since, oh my God, when was the R series launched? There was the R3 in Singapore. Yeah. Do you remember the one with the flip selfie camera, I have the motorized the flip? Yeah, I exactly. Have, I have that phone. And so that, by the way, the, the photos of that phone were trash. But, oh, then, yeah. but then by the time we got to like the R5 series, uh-huh. they were, they, even if they were doing Snapdragon 600 ISPs, Darling, those photos were really good. Yes, they were. I love. I love. I love them. I, I and so and so. I'm like, Oppo has been working really hard on their cameras in the most subtle way for years, and then they launched the Reno, and then they like they throw it out of the park with those cameras. They you know they bring us the the periscopic lens. It was their innovation, which they ditched now because they realize that consumers don't care about it more. I'm like. Why? Why are you doing the Hasselblad? Like, if anything, go rescue Leica because their phone sucks. But their partnership, <laughs> oh, yeah. with, but their partnership with Huawei was amazing. It's amazing, I know. And so, well, you, you guys don't need Hasselblad. You guys need Leica, if anything, if yeah. anything. And so, I'm sorry. You know, I'll probably meet somebody from Hasselblad, and they'll hate my guts. But I, I am just listen. I have so many photos of the Nine Pro with inconsistent results. I would take the photo right now. It would give me a specific color tuning for the lighting that it would pick up, and then I would take a photo a second later, and it would do the, the complete opposite. Like, yeah. like if, if if the light bulbs were orange, it would give them to me white. And yeah, so, like white balance all over the map. Darling, then the T-Mobile sent me a variant, and and I to put them next to each other, and so the nine for the nine series has been the first time that I completely ignore a OnePlus series and just leave it in the drawer. Yeah, me too. I didn't. Even, I was gonna make it my main phone. I was coming from OnePlus Eight Pro, which was and- almost perfect. 
And you know what I ended up doing? Uh-huh. I ended up living in in North America with an Oppo Find X3 Pro until the Pixel 6 Pro came out. And then the Find <laughs> X3 Pro comes out. And then, and then, and so the Hasselblad thing was one thing. Like, here's the thing. I like Color OS. I do. I do. I have been using it for so many years. I saw the whole transition from its iPhone-like design to go more. Oh my stock god, it Android. was so bad back it then. It was so bad back then. Actually, no. It was. I think that it's funny. Stock Color OS was better than iOS. It was a better version of iOS. <laughs> yeah, but than, for an Android user, right? For an Android user, and so it was. It was perfect. And then they made the transition into stock. You know, stock Android. Like I, I like it. But to force it down people's throats yeah. is the problem. And, and I just, I feel that one of the major selling points of OnePlus was Oxygen OS since day one. And so I, I, I don't understand why. Like, why not just continue giving people Oxygen OS for a couple of years? And they and then they can choose, or why don't they give us? You remember the times of the Google Play edition phones, and 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 you could just pick if you yeah. wanted one, yeah. if you wanted HTC Sense, or or at the time Samsung's uh, TouchWiz, or you could pick if you wanted stock Android. <laughs> like it was kind of disturbing to me. Like I was very much like a, it has to be Nexus back then. So and so I I think that OnePlus, you know, the whole Oxygen OS controversy. It, you know, beside the whole Hasselblad thing, which has me worried for for Oppo, is can you just create a skin on Color OS that makes it look like Oxygen OS, and the world is going to be happy? But I think that's what they did. Did you play with the Nord Two? Ah, uh, yes. And the Nord Two was the first that had Color OS with essentially Oxygen OS skin yeah. on top of it. Yeah. And I thought they did a very good job. I, you know, I it, hadn't thought about it. It that is doesn't so have true. quite all the features that we love from ColorOS, but you can feel like, you know, the settings menu and you're like, yeah, this is ColorOS, this is not <laughs> Oxygen. But it's very subtle, like it's not off-putting. I think that it, the, the Nord 2 is my favorite uh, OnePlus from last year. It's so good. And of course, we never see this in the US because the carriers forced OnePlus to make a OnePlus 9, which was a terrible phone. It was Because it didn't have OIS, phone. because it had a plastic frame. For the price point, it was a terrible phone. For- Eight hundred and eight ninety nine, I think it was. I was like, "Are you mad?" Yeah. So here's the thing: One Plus um, and this whole Oppo One Plus thing. Here's what confused me, and I need to get. I think I'm just gonna get Ryan to come on the show sometime and just do a show. Oh, with me. so you you do realize that Ryan and I, we can literally verbatim tell you the whole Spaceballs script. No, oh, that's awesome. Verbatim, like we yeah. know the whole movie by heart. That's hilarious. So here's what, what worries me is OnePlus launches the 10 Pro only and in China first with ColorOS. Then we get this Hasselblad leak on the Find X5 Pro. We also get SuperVOOC on the OnePlus 10 Pro in China, at least branding wise. And it's the first time we're getting OnePlus 10 Pro that doesn't launch globally. It launches in China first, which I understand. A lot of Chinese phones do that because yeah. Chinese New Year and, and want to be the first I get and that. all that stuff. Chip short. I get it. But I'm just, it doesn't feel to me, if there is a plan, it doesn't feel to me like there's a cohesive strategy here. And then, you know, this launch timeline on the OnePlus phones, there's rumors of a Nord N25 G coming to Europe. I thought that was going to come to the US. I'm actually pretty confident it was going to come to the US because we got the Nord N10 5G. We got the Nord N200 5G last year. The yeah. N200 5G was also a really decent oh, phone for the money. It was a great phone for the right? money. I, we, we crowned it best value. Yeah, me too. So I want this N25 G to come to the US and blow us away. You know, and the specs look right, but right now it says Europe only. Again, Ryan to the rescue. What is the strategy here? <laughs> and then the other thing is, you know, there's a CE2 coming. And the Nord CE, well, I never got to play with it because it's India only or whatever. It's like that, what is it? The OnePlus 9R? I don't know. You know, they have like these weird India yeah. parts specials, like parts bin. Yeah. Anyway, the, the point is, give us a sign even if you can't reveal the strategy, give us a sign <laughs> that you have a plan that makes sense because we're very confused. And I think you, you know, mm-hmm. people who are tech savvy early adopters who listen to my show, to your show, we're kind, they're kind of the OnePlus fans. They're kind of freaking out going like, you know, give us something we can kind of sink our teeth into and that makes sense to us, you know? Here's the thing. Do you think 
Because I think that this was OnePlus's time. LG is exiting the market. This was like, mm-hmm. it, it yeah. was literally, it's open for the kill. Just go for it. And so I think that they banked on the Nord in order to compensate for, because LG was mostly popular in their like feature phone, like really cheap smartphone space in the United States particularly. And I think that that Nord N200, like like it closed it that gap it. so well. Yeah. Nailed yeah. it. It's a beautiful phone with enough of everything for 200. Like I, I'm, t- I'm trying to remember what the price was. 200. But it, was, it was insane. I was like, whoa, this phone is too good for the money. It is too good for the money. It is the best cheap phone out there right now. Like, no no room for discussion. Uh, the, the problem is, you know, whether you like it or not, you need the Vanguard approach. Like, you need the phones that are going to make the buzzkill in order for your cheap phones to sell, whether you like it or not. You need that, like, performance in visual driver that's going to drive the sales of the cheap phones, which is what Samsung's been doing for I don't know how many years. Where their yeah. A series are the be- their best sellers, but their Galaxy S is their flagship. That's just the way it is, and so that's the Nord for them. Like the Nord is actually the phone that they're planning. To yeah, sell. the proper Nord. Yeah, is what I want to see in the U.S. from the carriers. That's right. I think the carrier phone. Bring us the Pro. That's our flagship. That's our S twenty one Ultra. That's aspirational. Get us a Nord in the U.S. But how about if we how about if we theorize since we don't know the strategy and nobody's going to provide it for us like. Can we assume that the 9 Pro was just too over the... Like, that lineup was just too over the top. I'm like, wait. You want to charge me a thousand dollars $1,056? How can you tell anyone in the United States to pick this phone over an iPhone? Or a Galaxy. Or a Galaxy. Which like, you I, can get on a discount. You literally walk into a carrier store and you will walk out with a Samsung Galaxy S21 of some kind with like a hundred bucks on the table. I guarantee you that. And so can can we theorize that it's probably that it didn't go so well with carrier deals for their Pro Series because the 9 Pro was such a bold bet that did not work? I think they delivered too little for too much price, like too yeah. too expensive. Yeah. And they didn't anticipate the what the competition was going to be doing. Right. And so I felt like, I'm like, I think that the company that was most in touch with reality during the pandemic, well, the first part, the pandemic part one, <laughs> was Samsung with their S20 FE. It was like, and then, Google, and then Google going full mid-ranger. It's like, people don't have money right now. Let's give them cheap phones. Yeah for high quality and then you're expecting you're expecting the dark knight to come in here you know yeah. with a one plus badge on the chest being and like, it did I, I, it did in europe with the nord yeah, and the nord with the, nord, <laughs> with the nord and the nord too like that's the thing that pisses me off but then they did not in the united states and i am like oh no what? well they did with the really cheap ones right the yeah. n series that's the thing the reason i think it's called n is north america that's why when i see rumors of the n20 going to europe i'm like it's an n that's north america those are specifically made for north america could be but i i just i i have a feeling that probably you know, their partnership with carriers just did not go well over the results of the 9 series last year. Well, the 9 sucked. It sucked. Like, and that was the carrier phone, right? Like, the, the Pro was never a carrier phone. The, the yeah. Pro was was like, you want to spend more and get the better phone, you do this. It's kind of like the the, no, six, but I, the Pixel 6 Pro. I got a 9 Pro from T-Mobile, so T-Mobile still adopted it. True, they did. Of course they did. T-Mobile still adopted it, but I don't, like, who was going to choose? Who was going to buy that? Who was going to, I'm like, okay, uh, do, listen, I have, I have, you know, what makes our channel most popular is comparisons. And right. I'm like, this is the first time in history that an iPhone is, the most expensive iPhone is going to beat a OnePlus phone. Like, I have, I have been doing comparisons against OnePlus phones for years, yeah. and it makes no sense. Like, and then I compare, uh, and I'm like, I'm not even going to compare this 9 Pro against the Ultra. It makes no sense. You know what? I'm going to compare it against the S9 Plus, just to make this fair. And it just, it, it obliterated it in every sense of the word. And I'm like, why? Like, why does this phone exist? Like, I understand that you want to play with the big kids. I understand that this has been your best year in sales and everything. I just, I'm sorry, but it's very hard for you to convince people. Very different to Huawei. 
like I think that Huawei was the perfect example of a company that could play cheap. Like they started as a cheap company. I, you and I were people that would not review Huawei phones in the beginning. <laughs> they yeah. would reach out and we were like, like, I remember getting some of the first mate phones and they were just like badly manufactured and, and you could see some blown up portions like Tesla's where certain parts of like the yeah, frame are not necessarily probably, al- yeah. aligned and everything. And then these guys go out and launch the P9. Oh, the P9 was a, radical game changer. They launched the Nexus 6P, like that was their proof of concept, yeah. Nexus 6P. And then the moment they launched their P9, that was it. Like I was like, that was the first time that I reached out to Huawei and I was yep. like, I Give want me. that phone. Yep. And the Leica branding and oh man, so good. And so if you can give me results which is what the 9 Pro had to do. If you were going to go bold enough to pay so much money for Hasselblad, you had to own it with the product. I would have had no problem in recommending a $1,056 OnePlus phone with amazing software, yeah. great support, a great build. I love the design. It looked like a freaking 50s classic. I love the it phone. It was awesome. Yeah, me too. Until I took the first photo and I was like, what the f-? I was like, what the yeah. hell? 100%. Same here. I was just like, I cannot believe the photos I'm getting out of this. The inconsistency and everything. And then, again, I feel like I would have been a little bit more forgiving if the OnePlus 9 had been priced a little more aggressively for the carriers, exactly. had delivered OIS on the main lens, even with a plastic frame, like that it hadn't yeah. decontented. Like it's a Hasselblad phone and it has no OIS. Who at yeah. Hasselblad even let that happen? Well, who at OnePlus? Like I can understand the people at BBK going, cost saving. Right, I can understand the carrier saying, "Oh, take out OIS. We don't want to pay for that." But I cannot understand how Hasselblad said, "Yeah, you can still have our name on that." Because I'm telling you, I think that OnePlus did Hasselblad a favor. Like, yeah, I don't think Hasselblad is in touch with the market. Like, what do they sell? Only medium format cameras? Like, it's a very <laughs> small niche. I know, I know. I mean, anyway, we should wrap up, but. Jaime, do you want to tell folks where they can find you on the internet and you want to pin Pocket Now too? Yeah, Pocket Now everywhere or Jaime Rivera on Instagram. That's mostly where I'm at. You're not on Twitter? You don't want to do Twitter anymore? Uh, Jaime underscore Rivera on, on Twitter. It's just, I, it's funny. The guy that has my Jaime Rivera account on Twitter, he's like, I'll trade you. You give me your Instagram, I'll give you the Twitter at Jaime <laughs> Rivera. I'm like, whatever. Yeah, no. Nah. <laughs> well, there you go, folks. So, Follow Jaime on Twitter and Instagram. And you know where to find me on the internet. I'm at Tankerl. That's T-N-K-G-R-L. Both on Instagram and on Twitter. So if you want to, you know, uh, discuss this podcast with us, just uh, tweet at us. And uh, if you want to see pretty pictures of phones and pretty pictures taken with phones, pretty pictures of cars, since I do car reviews for Tech Radar, just check that out on my Instagram. There's a couple of YouTube channels to subscribe to that are uh, related to the podcast with visuals. YouTube.com slash mobile tech podcast and YouTube.com slash mobile tech more. The first one is all the unboxing videos and the actual phone and some like direct peripherals like the earbuds, headphones, that stuff. And then the other channel is more like home automation, car tech, travel tech, more peripheral, distant to the phone, but related. So you know how YouTube works. Just, you know, subscribe, like all that good stuff, comment, because, you know, I love to read your comments. And if you don't want to comment on Twitter about the podcast, you can do it on the YouTube channels as well. And then, of course, the podcast lives at mobiletechpodcast.com. There is an RSS feed there, but we're on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, everywhere good podcasts can be found. So please subscribe. It helps. And if your app lets you rate or review the show, consider doing that. It helps other people find the show better. And of course, there's a Patreon. I mentioned that halfway through the show. Patreon.com slash tankerl. That's patreon.com slash T-N-K-G-R-L. If you forget, it's like the comic book character Tankerl. Just drop all the vowels. And so the Patreon has a bunch of tiers. One of them is for Discord channel. You can chat with me there. There is the video podcast. Uh, that's a separate tier. And you get to see that every week ahead of time, slightly less edited, more raw, more real. And then, you know, there's a bunch of other stuff. Check it out. Help me out. This is how I make this podcast happen through your financial help and support. So consider that. 
patreon.com slash tankgirl. If you don't like Patreon, I get it. There is a PayPal link in the show notes. You can just make a donation, buy me a coffee, whatever. So I also want to thank our sponsors this week, which is Infineon. Infineon is a top 10 global semiconductor solutions provider and a leader in smart, secure, and connected devices. In case you don't know, this is me adding to their blurb, they do a lot of power management chips, a lot of the chips used in electric cars for the drivetrain, the inverters. Um, They do a lot of sensor chips as well. And uh, they're pretty much essential to our everyday lives. So You know, we had a good conversation about private 5G networks earlier in the show, and I want to thank Judy again for being my guest for that part of the show. And Jaime, thanks again for being my guest on the rest of the show. Appreciate it. I appreciate you as well, darling. Folks, we'll be on next week with another show. I'll have Jaime again at some point in the future. Until then, cheers, everybody. This has been the Mobile Tech Podcast with Tank Girl, proudly presented by worldpodcasts.com. You can visit us online at mobiletechpodcast.com.